We have some big flare players that are putting on a show, and they've launched multiple solar storms that are headed towards Earth. Those stories and more are in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is picking up in a big way. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, we do have a lot of active regions in Earth view, but region 3842 is leading the fray. In fact, back on the 29th, pow, right there, it fires off a big M-class flare with a gorgeous display here. As we look at it in slow motion, you can actually see what a spectacular display this was. It also launched an, a non-Earth-directed solar storm, but we could look at this as kind of like the warning shot across the bow because from this point on this region starts getting even more active. We also have a small filament that erupted here on the 30th. You can watch it launch here. It's just a narrow little thing, whoosh, right like that. And then right after that you can see a, a, another filament launch that way. Both of these, this one is slightly uh, northward directed, this one is southeast directed, so likely not going to be big impacts at Earth. But as we continue watching region 38 42, we start noticing its magnetic complexity right about here really started getting busy. You can see a lot of emergence in here. Look at all this stuff beginning to shear and pull this way. You can see these regions right in here really beginning to, to build up that magnetic complexity and that, that un instability. And in fact, they fire a little uh, flare right about there. That is what you'll see as the uh, M7 0.6 flare right there. That was that one that where those two regions got really close together. That didn't launch a big solar storm, but right late on the first, you actually can watch this thing fire off an X7.15 flare. Bam! Right there. That actually led to a radio blackout. This is an R3 level radio blackout that hit the Western Hemisphere as well as the Asian Pacific and Australia. It la didn't last all that long, but this region did launch a gorgeous solar storm, and you can see the blast wave from this storm right here. It definitely is partly Earth-directed, so we're going to talk more about that when it comes to the models here in a minute. Sadly, we did not have great coronagraph images. Here we're like taking a look at stereo, and when we look at stereo, the, eh, it's not a great oh, halo. We were hoping to get a full halo from this structure. Even from stereo's vantage point, it just doesn't look all that great. So it's going to be a bit slow lower than we expect, but we'll talk more about that in the models. Meanwhile, we've been also watching region 3841 because it's beginning to pick up in activity. Region 3842 is also still going to be uh, a big X flare player, so expect these R3 level radio blackouts to continue and expect that noise floor to continue to pick up. And as this region rotates through the Earth strike zone, we could get the chance for even more Earth-directed solar storms. And just as I was getting ready to post my forecast, believe it or not, the sun fires again. This time it fires three different solar storms in the last 24 hours, and they're not all from region 3842. In fact, the first one is from region 3841. You can watch the slow poof right there. That is actually a very slow moving and narrow earth directed solar storm, but we can't really see it in coronagraphs. The next one is from region 3848. You can watch the filament erupt and lift off to the east of Earth, but then not to be outdone, region 3842, pow, right there, fires the largest X-class flare of this solar cycle. And this was an X9-class flare, which meant that it gave us a nearly an R4-level radio blackout. You can see it right here all over Europe, uh, Africa, and even the eastern seaboard of the Western Hemisphere. In fact, this radio blackout actually had a radio burst that went up into the L-band. So you GPS users, if you've noticed some issues, well, that might have been from this X-class flare.
flare if you were on the day side of Earth. On top of that, this region also fired a massive solar storm. You can watch this huge blast wave all the way around, almost dead center for Earth. This is a big solar storm uh, in terms of speed. In fact, when we take a look at it in coronagraphs, strangely enough, the coronagraphs are kind of a mess. This is that we don't see that Earth-directed solar storm, but we do see the eastward-directed solar storm. Then we see this halo, boom, right there. You can see that halo all the way around the sun. That's from the, the solar storm launched with the X9 flare. And then we even have another solar storm that's launched to the east of Earth. And we think, okay, so now there's three more, right? Well, where's the third one? Okay, right here, look at region 3843, not to be outdone. It now fires, bam, right there. It fires an Earth-directed solar storm. This one doesn't look like it's going to be completely Earth-directed. It's just partly Earth-directed. And we are waiting for coronagraphs and for model predictions to get a better idea. But what it definitely means is that Aurora is coming and we will have a period of extended storming. And now switching to our full sun map, we're actually using SDO, AIA, Stereo, EUVI, and Solar Orbiter EUI imagery on this particular map in all these three colors to get a full idea of what might be lurking on the sun's far side. Now, as we take a look at the active regions in Earth view, this should orient you a little bit. You're getting a, a good view of region 3836 that's rotated to the sun's far side. We're going to pass the east limb on this side and you're going to see it pop out over here. Here's region 3842 right now. This is the region that has been firing off that big Earth-directed solar storm and that X-class flare, and likely more is coming. But here's the thing. When we take a look at solar orbiter data over the last uh, you know, few days, we've been looking at old region 3824. This region has been firing big solar flares on the sun's far side. And so this region, as it's getting close to that east limb, we could be seeing this thing pop into Earth view over the next couple days and firing more big solar flares. So you amateur radio operators and emergency responders, I know you're still dealing with Hurricane Helene and the aftermath of all of those people on the East Coast, especially in places like North Carolina. Understand you're going to have a lot more noise on the bands and it's likely not going to go away this week. You could also see R3 level radio blackouts. So some of those nets, you might need to do them in the evening time. Uh, if you're getting too much noise on the bands, be sure to uh, be, make sure that you check that out as well. But that's going to have to be after, of course, the solar storm passes. Now, returning to those Earth-directed solar storms, we switched to our solar storm prediction model, Enlil. Now, this is NOAA's version of the model. The top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity. You're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. Now, as I set this solar storm model in motion, you will see the first solar storm being launched. This is the storm that was associated with the X7 flare. And this storm is actually moving a bit more slowly than we would anticipate. However, as this storm impacts Earth, NOAA is expecting impact to be about 7 UTC on the 4th. Likely, it's going to impact us slower than that. But remember, we have two other small solar storms ahead of this region. So what we're going to likely see is some activity starting around the 4th and likely this storm arriving closer to the 5th, maybe late day on the 4th. Now, the second solar storm that we have right here, this is the storm associated with the X9 class flare and it's moving much more quickly. To answer the question as to whether or not it's going to catch up to this one, no, it won't catch up, but you can see it moving more slowly or more, more rapidly and catching up almost. NOAA has this one impacting Earth about 1800 UTC on the 5th. Now remember, we also have a solar storm sandwiched between these two, and it's a small solar storm and it's kind of weak, but it's still going to mean that it's going to be enhanced by being kind of squished in like almost a cookie <laughs> with the two so big solar storms on either side of it. So expect storming to start sometime about early to mid on the 4th, then expect it to get a lot stronger when the first solar big solar storm hits closer to the 5th. And then we're going to have this next one hitting us right around the, maybe late on the 5th, early into the 6th. So we're going to have some extended storming. But because of the sparsity of the coronagraph data, we actually have some, you know, kind of a big window of uh, arrival times. So aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, you know, just kind of hang in there if the storm arrives late. Just 
plan for a little extra time because we should get a decent show from this one. Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the new moon phase on our way to a first quarter. And that new moon was so wonderful because it gave us that annular solar eclipse in the southern hemisphere. So hopefully those of you were able to enjoy that. And now it's going to be a pretty dark moon because by the 7th, it's going to be less than 30% illuminated. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora, well, now is your perfect chance. Switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, it's going to be a busy week, folks. We have multiple big solar storms on their way with smaller solar storms kind of stacked in between them. At high latitudes, we could expect severe storming, possibly at the G3 to G4 level. In fact, NOAA is giving us about a 75% to an 80% chance of severe storming on the 4th through the 6th before things begin to calm down. And this is likely not the end because we're likely going to have yet another solar storm partly hit Earth after the 6th. So aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, of course you're going to get some gorgeous shows. They're going to be extended. But if you are a radio communicator at high latitudes, know that you're going to have some severe impacts to your radio communications on Earth's night side. Now, as we switch to our mid-latitude aurora possibilities. Well, we're only expecting major storm to possibly a severe storm by the 6th, likely G2 to G3 levels. In fact, NOAA's giving us about a 30 to 40 percent chance of a severe storm. I'm bumping that up to a 60 percent chance of a severe storm at a G3 level. Not sure we're going to see G4 levels, but this is good enough. And then again, by the 7th, we could see more storming because we do have that other partly Earth-directed solar storm that's going to be on its way that we don't have any data to really look at yet. So expect this back part of this uh, forecast to change pretty rapidly. And again, if you're a radio operator, especially in the hurricane devastated areas, understand that nighttime communications is going to be a real uh, pain, to, to put it lightly. So you're going to have to deal with that. And dayside radio communications is not going to be all that much better. Speaking of daytime radio communications, as we switch to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week, we are sitting well into the triple digits. We're popping over 300 right now for solar flux, and that's likely going to continue throughout this week because region 3842 is now not only the big X flare player, we've got multiple regions now that have X flare potential. We're definitely sitting at the severe noise level. This is for the dayside radio band. So those of you working HF and even the repeaters on VHF expect contacts to be noisy, especially in those hurricane devastated areas. So just continue to work at it and you know try both day side and night side if you are having trouble contacting people. NOAA's giving us about a 75% chance for M-class flares. This is at the R1 to R2 level radio blackout over the next three days. I'm extending that out through the five day. They're also giving us about a 35% chance of uh, X-class flares. That's at the R3 level radio blackout. And we've already seen that we're almost at the R4 level radio blackout at least once uh, earlier today. So again, Radio communicators understand that you're going to have these periodic radio blackouts and just kind of bear with it. You can hear the noise rise and then the noise fall. It's not your rig and just keep at it because these radio blackouts on Earth's day side are not going away anytime soon. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week, we are sitting at the D1 normal range at flight level 360. This is for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everybody else. But take a look at this. NOAA is giving us about a 35% chance of an S1 to S2 level radiation storm over the next three days. And again, I have bothered to extend it out through the five day. And this is mainly due to region 3842, but we do have a couple other big flare players in earth view in fact this risk may actually rise just a little bit as uh, the region these regions rotate to the west limb so you frequent flyers and this does include air crew uh, and high risk passengers understand that everything is in the green right now but pay attention to those ICAO advisories because things may change quite quickly and you're going to want to take this into consideration in your flight plans 
So the space weather this week is getting very active. We have multiple big solar storms on their way to Earth, and they're sandwiched between these smaller solar storms, and they're kind of making a long solar storm train. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, we could see a G3 to G4 level storming from about the 4th into about the 7th, possibly the 8th, before things calm down. Now, Aurora photographers at mid-latitudes, well, we're likely to see a G2 to possibly G3 level storming, but I'm not going to rule out a G4 well, if we see that, it's going to be after the Earth gets a bit preconditioned. So probably around the 6th is where we could actually see a G4 level if it manifests. And for those of you who are worried, no, this isn't going to be a G5 level solar storm. But if you'd like to help out, feel free to dial down your electricity usage, especially in the evening time, because that will actually help take the load off the grids, because this is an extended storm period, and big grids, power grids, don't like storms that last a long time. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you know, the day side and the night side both are going to be tough this week. We've got big R3, almost R4 level radio blackouts that are occurring right now on Earth's day side. So if you get blacked out, just understand, try again in another half an hour or so, especially if you're working in those hurricane affected regions, uh, because I know there are disasters. There's so much communication that still needs to be gotten out. And now for you GPS, users and you drone pilots. If you happen to be working the hurricane disaster areas, just know that those radio blackouts on Earth's day side will give you the most trouble near dawn and near dusk in terms of GPS reception. And also know that if you happen to be working at night, things can also be a bit dicey if you're anywhere near Aurora. And you will also need to make sure you calibrate your magnetometers often. So be sure to stay vigilant. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.